as we were just singing this, there I can hear myself. There, you go. there we go. That our lesson today lines up with our first song a little bit, being holding out. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to read one verse of scripture. And Mr. Matt, I believe I'm a little on the loud side. I'm starting to hear a little feedback. Would you mind turning me down just a bit? We're going to read one scripture. It's Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You can be seated. Thank you for standing for the reading of the word. The reason I say that I feel like they match, if you're determined to hold out to the end, if you're determined, you're not going to walk in the flesh, but you're going to walk in the Spirit. Abriel says amen. I'm going to say amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Putting your flesh under submission can be one of the hardest things to do. Putting your flesh under control, putting it in its place, it can be harder than a lot of things. It can be, there, there are people who can race for hours on end. There are people who can climb mountains, who can do crazy stunts that in parkour, that they can ride a bike for miles and hours or days. There are things that people can do and they put their bodies under subjection. But when it comes to something that you really, really, really want, man, that just looks good. Man, I just gotta get me that. Your mind can't stop thinking about it. To give you an example about myself, my work has a shop account that you're able to buy tools and then they take a little bit out of your paycheck every week and it is the most dangerous thing in the world. Because I see a brand new tool that I really, really want and I'm like, my shop account is too high or you know, I need to stop just buying every tool that I see or whatever the case might be. And all day long. I kid you not. Man, I could use this right now. That new tool, it would be so handy if I had it right now. And I'll come back to lunch and I'll look at the paper that's on the table again and I'll see that brand new tool right there on the paper. It's only $3.99 or whatever the price might be. You know, something pretty far out there. And I'll be like, I could put it in this spot in the van. I can make sure that it's safe there. I already have a battery for it, or I already have the blades for it, or whatever the case. This, this right here was an example of uh, getting stuck in my mind. Had to have it. I had to have it. I had to have it. It's got a nice little light on it. Comes in handy. It's got a nice little laser pointer on it. That comes in handy. Did I need it? It comes in handy. Don't get me wrong. I like having flashlights on me. It comes in handy, but I had it stuck in my mind. Had it stuck in my mind. I wasn't able to get my next day of work done without this flashlight. Obviously not, not literally, but it was so stuck in my mind that that's all I could think about. And when it comes to our flesh and the things we want, that's what it comes down to, is that's all we can think about. If you feed your flesh, it's never satisfied. When we try and put our flesh under submission, it's never fun. The pride of life, or the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are three things that, unless I'm mistaken, the devil really has nothing to do with. Unless I'm mistaken, the devil is not out there causing you to lust after something. So these three things, these issues that 
our flesh deals with, that we have to deal with because we're in flesh, the devil hasn't even really done anything about that. That's just life. So today we're going to talk a little bit about life and not feeding our flesh. Often Christians want to live for God. They want to do things for God. I want to pray more. I want to read more. I want to be used in church. I want to be used in God's kingdom. I want to do more. I want to be more in God's kingdom. But what holds them back is their own flesh. Their own unsubmissive flesh. The things that they have just let run uncontrolled. And that holds them back from being able to be used by God. 2 Peter 2 and 9 says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve, reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Or in other words, God knows how to help us out of temptations. Our own flesh that we deal with, God knows what to do. So where does that leave us? Yeah. That leaves us as the deciding factor. We go to God and say, God, I need a little bit of help out of this. Done. Yeah. We're walking in the spirit. We're walking towards God. Done. But if we decide, I don't know, I just can't stop thinking about that. That just seems really nice. That just seems like something I should have. I know it's not really good. Am I being too plain this morning? Good, because I'm going to get a lot more plain. Anything you try to do on your own, any struggles you try and and face on your own, especially dealing with the flesh, you can have a lot of perseverance. You can have a lot of grit and, and hold out and say, I know that's not good for me. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna go there. There are people who quit smoking cold turkey without God. So, People can have the strong enough will to do it, but the thing about having God is when your will is really not there, you're able to go to God and say, God, I can't deal with this temptation right now. I need a little bit of help. Amen? Walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5 and 16, but this time in the Amplified Version. It says, but I say walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Responsive to and controlled, or to, yeah, to and controlled and guided by the Spirit, then you will certainly not gratify the cravings you desire of the flesh, of human nature without God. There is a lot to unpack here, and I regret we're not going to unpack all of that said. We're going to look at that first portion there. But I say walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Holy Spirit. To have a habit means that's what you're used to. How many people have a habit? Oh yeah, I have a habit. I wake up in the morning, I get my cereal, I've let the dogs out, I go to work. That's a habit. It's not a fun one. (laughs) After supper, I go get the ice cream out of the freezer. I got the spoon already in there, and I eat a little bit of ice cream. (laughs) That's a habit. On Saturdays, sometimes I'll eat some ice cream after lunch. (laughs) And supper. (laughs) Exactly. That's a habit. It's something easy to fall back into. And you know what happens after supper if I don't have any ice cream? Living in the dark ages. If I don't have any ice cream that day, My body is like, hey, we're missing something. My mind says, hey, there's supposed to be something sweet after eating all that meat. There's supposed to be something sweet now. It's a habit. So if we build a habit walking in the spirit, if we build a habit walking with God, when it comes time for temptations, it's not going to waver us because we've got a habit. The temptations come and we say, oh, you know, it's so much easier to say no to that because I've fed the spirit so much more. I'm I'm hungry for what that has so much more. I have a habit that I can fall back into. 
So walking with God is not just like a stroll in the park. Walking with God isn't something that we do just because, oh, it's a nice day out. I think I'll pray today. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Who wants to go for a walk when it's raining out? Yeah. You're crazy if you do. When it's, when it's cold and... <laughs> when it's cold and... I just want to stay home, snuggled under a blanket, yeah. not go to work, because work means I'm going to have to be cold out in the rain. But when it's a beautiful day out, when the sun is shining, when there's a nice uh, crisp breeze out, it's beautiful. I would love to go on a walk. Walking with God is not that way, though. Walking with God means even when you don't feel like it, you need to build that habit. You need to build that habit so that it's easier when temptations come to be able to avoid them. Now, we are going to deal with fleshly struggles. I hate to say it. I don't like it. I wish we didn't have to. But we are going to deal with the things of this world and the things in this life because we've got skin on our bones. We are still flesh. So we're, we're going to deal with some stuff. Now, being baptized in Jesus' name, being filled with the Holy Ghost, that brings you a new life, and it does help. It does help. Yes, absolutely. Because we get victory through Jesus Christ, but it's not, it's not to say that we'll never have to deal with something again. We'll never have to deal with any struggles again, because yeah. that's not how life works. Yeah. There was an elderly woman that came to a preacher and asked the preacher, said, Preacher, can you cast this devil out of me? And the preacher said, I wish you had a devil in you. Because that would be easier to deal with. You can bind and cast out a devil better than you can deal with a human spirit. Oftentimes, a human spirit you have to deal with again and again and again. Every morning you wake up, you have to decide, am I going to let my flesh win or am I going to follow God? Amen. Sometimes multiple times through the day. Yeah. If we are walking in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, I'm going to put a little disclaimer in. I don't believe anybody is thinking this, but we are being recorded, and I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page here. Take care of your bodies. Yeah. When I am saying... Don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I am not saying that we need to do some kind of craziness. Okay? Your body needs sleep. Your body needs food. Your body needs rest. Okay? Just to make sure we're all on the same page here. I am not saying that you should forego sleep so that you can start praying to get closer to God you're going to start seeing crazy things because your mind's hallucinating, okay? I am not saying you should cut out all your food because your body needs energy to run. You want to be used in God's kingdom, your body needs to be at a good peak performance of being able to be used. You got to take care of your body. That's in, it's the temple of God. You need to relax, okay? So... I'm saying don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, and we're going to go into more detail. Paul goes into more detail, but I wanted to make sure to put that disclaimer. I am not saying that you should do something crazy. Yeah. Everybody still with me? Amen. It's important to stay healthy, and it becomes a problem when you're going too far into, well... I need to eat more. I need to sleep more. I need to rest more. We're going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. The more you give into the desires of your flesh, the more time-consuming it becomes. Yeah. Romans 8 and 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. In other words, if all I'm thinking about is this guy right here, if all I'm thinking about is that brand new tool and how, how nice that is, I'm not thinking about work. Yeah. I'm thinking
think about this new tool and how nice it would be to have that new tool. It's the same way with God. We come, we come to God and all we're thinking about is the problems we got to deal with at home yeah. or man, I know I shouldn't be looking at that, but I really want to get out of church so I can go start looking at that or man, I'm bored of hearing this guy talking for the past 10 minutes already. I just want to scroll on Facebook. If you feed your flesh, if you feed the desires of your flesh, that's all you're going to be hungry for. That's all your mind is going to be consumed by. But if you're, uh, if you're thinking about the things of God, if you are seeking after the things of God, that's what you're going to desire. The more you pray, the more you want to pray. The less you pray, the less you want to pray. The more you miss church, the less you'll miss church. The more you miss praying, the less you'll miss praying. Unrestrained, desirous flesh is never satisfied. People who have billions and billions and billions of dollars, more money than they know what to do with, they, they could have just about anything they want. They'd sign a check. they tell their secretary to go get it. They'd, whatever the case might be, they can have it, no problem. And their flesh is still not satisfied. They got to have more. They need more of something. Galatians 5 and 17 says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. They butt heads. My body does not want to wake up early and pray. My body does not want to stay up late and read the Bible or whatever the case may be. It would much rather scroll on YouTube. It would much rather sleep in a little bit. The flesh and the spirit, they fight against each other. You are the deciding factor. They are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. But, verse 18, if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So attempting to do the work of God, attempting to live for God and walk in the Spirit while feeding your flesh, while giving in to the desires of your flesh, are going to cause frustrations. It's going to cause a lot of problems in your life. Because you are trying to live for God, but you won't give up what your flesh is wanting. You won't give up that time. You won't give up that mindset. You won't give up whatever the case may be. There's a lot of things out there that are not bad that just suck up your time, that suck up your, your, your mind, that suck up, and they, they take that all away so then you're not thinking about God. And then you come to church, or it's Friday night, and you need to get in touch with God, and you're so far away from Him. If you are trying to live for God and satisfy your flesh at the same time, you're going to find yourself in a spiritual tug of war. If you're getting frustrated because you find it hard to pray or to read your Bible... Try cutting some of those dopamine drips out of your life. And by dopamine drips, I mean the things that make us super happy. They, they've done studies that when you get a text message, opening your phone is like opening a present on Christmas. Your, your body, your mind gets that dopamine drip. You get a notification and your, your mind is immediately going to, oh, I can't wait to see who it's from. You get a Facebook notification. Oh, I can't wait to see who commented. I can't wait to see how many people have liked it. Try cutting some of that dopamine drips out of your life and then go pray and then go read. You'll have a much easier time because there will be less fighting yeah. happening between your body and the spirit. Amen? 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Pastor Simmerman talked about this, I don't know, I don't remember how many months ago, Wednesdays ago, but it was a while ago, and it stuck out to me. Be unmovable. Yeah. 
Be unmovable. You get, you get linesmen on a football field. Their job is to crash into the other guys. Their job is to make sure that nothing comes through. They are holding back one, two, or three guys, all sitting there, arms wide, arms forward, whatever, pushing with everything they've got to not let the enemy team come through. We need to be the same way with God. Paul used plenty of sports analogies in his scripture. I, I, feel, I feel it's appropriate to throw one in every now and then. Be steadfast, unmovable. Be consistent. Have it be a habit and don't waver. Don't sway away from it. We need to be immovable with our, wa- with our walk and with our work for the Lord. If you continue to satisfy your flesh, if you continue to let the flesh win, you're disqualified from the kingdom of God. Walk in the spirit and do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh because eternity is at stake. This, this, is, this is not just a, hey, let's get together Sunday mornings for a good social club. We'll sing a few songs. Maybe we'll get some goosebumps. We'll get to feeling okay. This will be all right. There is so much more at stake here. There is so much more at stake. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And I don't know about you, but I want to go to heaven. I need to be determined to hold out to the end. Amen? So... Let's take a minute, and we're going to talk about the works of the flesh. Galatians 5 goes through and lists out, I believe it was 12 of them, I don't remember the exact number, 17, might have been 17, that number rings a bell, lists out 17 of them, and we're going to to do more than just read them, we're going to actually look at the meaning behind them, and I'm not going to take very long on this. But I am going to explain why I'm doing this. Because, for example, let's take the word, hopefully I don't get in trouble for this, we're going to take the word gay. 50 years ago, that meant happy. Nowadays, it means homosexual. So that being said, the King James translation was written in 1611 or thereabouts. There are a few words that don't have the same meaning as they do now. Or, even if they carry the same meaning, they've kind of lost use. Mm -hmm. And so, like the word lasciviousness. When was the last time you used the word lasciviousness? (laughs) I don't know about you, but I used it last Tuesday. No! (laughs) The word, Old King James English, was what they had. It was very good. But we're going to go through and we're going to actually look at the meaning behind it because Paul wrote these out to have an impact on the reader. And if we don't understand what he's trying to say, how can it have that impact? We're going to just gloss over it, and I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds bad, so I'll just make sure I don't do any of that lasciviousness. Right? So... The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, number one. Adultery. Merriam-Webster defines it as voluntary sexual intercourse between a married man and some other than his wife, or between a married woman and some other than her husband. Next word. Fornication. You all right over there? (laughs) Fornication. The Greek word, the original Greek word is Pornia, illicit sexual intercourse, immoral sexual conduct and intercourse, including taking pleasure in pornographic images, films, or writings. The next word, uncleanness, means impurity, physically or morally. A, a, for example, a person could have a clean, magnificent, everything's tidy home, but... 
their moral, their mind, their moral compass, completely messed up. Their mind's always talking about dirty stuff. Their mind is always thinking about dirty stuff. You say something and they're like, and you're like, get your mind out of the gutter, dude. They can have a clean home, but a dirty mind, that's still considered uncleanness. Yeah. Amen? There's, there's the word lasciviousness. Next, right there. <laughs> lasciviousness. The original Greek, asalgia, unbridled lust, wantonness. The full life Bible study includes comments describing this as sensuality, following one's own passions and desires to the point of having no shame or public decency. Desiring something so bad that you don't care what you look like, you don't care how you act, you don't care what it, who's around. There are plenty of substances that will make you do that. There are plenty of mindsets. Think about that. Not caring how you look or how you act, there is a movement in our world today that causes people to dress very bad, practically nude, and not care who's around, not care what's around, and they're going to do whatever they feel like. Yeah. Because they're more worried about, that's lasciviousness. Yeah. Everybody still with me? Yep. Idolatry. The worship of false gods, little g gods. The worship of false gods. Witchcraft, this one I thought was interesting. The original Greek word, pharmakia, means a drug or an enchantment. Hatred, hostility, a reason for opposition, constantly needing to be in a fight. Variance means contention, strife, or wrangling. Emulations. I'll be honest, that's one word. I'd just be like, okay, moving on. <laughs> Emulations. The original Greek word is zelos. Excitement of mind, ardor, fervor of spirit, an envious, contentious rivalry or jealousy. Wrath, passion, angry heat, strife, according distinction, a desire to put oneself forward, a partisan, a, fact, a factuous spirit, or in other words, causing trouble. Yeah. Seditions, divisions, dissensions. Heresies, a dissent or a deviation from a dominant theory. Heresy. When you got something true and somebody's saying the exact opposite of that, that's heresy. Envyings. Or it's other words, next verse, 21 there, Matt. Envyings. Jealousy or spite. Murders. That one's pretty straightforward. Yeah. The original Greek word is phonos, it means to slay or to murder. Yeah. These are the works of the flesh. Drunkenness, or the original Greek word is methai. Intoxication, drunkenness is the definition. Which, let's be honest, intoxication can happen with a lot more than just alcohol. Yeah, yeah. Revelings. This one I thought was interesting. The original Greek word is, is komoi, and it means to be loose like a carousel. It means like a carousel, to be loose. Revelings. Or in other words, uh, the, the New International Version describes it, as, or translates it as orgies. The Full Life Study Bible comments it as an excessive feasting and revelry, a party spirit, including alcohol, drugs, sex, etc. Revelings. So, very interesting, very, very, when you really get deep down to it, it's more than just looking at the words we know and that we understand and, and kind of glossing over the rest. Yeah. Now, this is not covering every known vice that there is to our human spirit. That's not covering every single thing that is out there. But I'd say it covers a good majority of everything. And we know that it all stems from 1 John 2 and 16. All that is in the world... 
the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. Paul wrote to the Galatians, spelling this out for them in order to realign them. In order to realign them with God and say, hey, these are the works of the flesh. You need to put them down. You need to make sure you're avoiding those things because they are not helping you get closer to God. In fact, most of them lead to sin. Most of them lead to death. Probably all of them. So we can take this as a warning ourselves. It's never fun to inspect your life and inspect your walk with God and inspect your everyday continuing. It's never fun to look at, at yourself and say, okay, where am I falling short? What do I still need to take care of? What, would, what is holding me back from getting closer to God? It's not fun, but it's imperative. It is so important. We need to be able to take a look at our lives and be honest and say, I need to cut back a little bit on this. I need to cut back on, on pleasuring myself so much with Facebook or so much with YouTube, or whatever, Netflix. There are so many things out there, magazines, newspapers. You could, you could sit down and read a newspaper for three hours a day, but you can't read the Bible. You could sit down and watch Netflix, and oh, I accidentally binged a whole season of whatever, but I can't read my Bible. These are the things that the Bible is talking about. Paul says the same things to Roman, said to the Romans. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh will set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit will focus on the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You want a little bit of peace in your life? Start focusing on God. For the carnal mind is hostile towards God, fights against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Verse 8. And those who are of the flesh cannot please God. Ooh. Ooh. You, however, talking to the Romans, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God does live in you. If you've got the Holy Ghost, make sure you're walking in with the Holy Ghost, yeah. not feeding your flesh, if it does indeed live in you. Now, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Skipping down to verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. In other words, because we have been set free, because we do not have to be subject to that anymore, we don't have to give in to those old temptations. We have a new life. We've been born again. We've been baptized in Jesus' name. we got the Holy Ghost. We don't have to be subject to those things anymore. Yeah. Verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Yep. But if through the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Amen? Galatians 5 and 22 because not just talking about the things of the flesh, but we're going we're gonna to touch on the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, or in other words, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith. Verse 23, meekness, temperance, or... Oh, my brain went completely blank. Temperance. Thank you, self-control. Against such, there is no law. If you're following God and you're getting closer to God, these attributes are going to show in your life. These things will start to, to develop in your life. You'll, you'll have love. You'll have peace. You'll have joy. Yeah. You'll have self-control. And so on and so on and so on. Amen. Now, God has unique plans for each one of us. God has unique plans for you. God has a unique plan for you. I'm going to try and make sure I pointed everybody so nobody feels left out. God has a unique plan for you. But 
His will is for us to all live an empowered and victorious life following him, not following our flesh. Galatians 5 and 25 says, if you walk in the spirit, or if if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If we've been filled with the Holy Ghost, if we're trying to live for God, we need to make sure we are walking with God. It's just the same as if somebody doesn't show up to work. Doesn't show up to work for a month. Are they going to have any idea what's going on? Is the boss going to call them up and say, hey, yesterday there was a big mess, a big accident. Do you know what happened? They've got no idea. We cannot say we're, we're living for God if we're never walking with God. Amen? Am I being too mean? No. Okay. Galatians 5 and 26. This is where we're going to wrap up. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Don't be conceited. When we put our flesh under submission and we start walking with God, it has happened many times and it can happen where Christians think that they've made it. They have arrived. I am so spiritual now. I have, I have made it. There are no temptations that can get to me Because I'm living for God, I'm following God, I'm not going to give in to any temptations of my flesh. But if they've got that mindset, they've they've already pretty much started back at square one. Don't be conceited. Be vigilant. Last scripture, Philippians 1 and 6, and I am sure that God who began the good work within you will keep right on helping you grow in his grace until his task within you is finally finished on that day when Jesus Christ returns. God's not going to give up on you. Don't give up on God. Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. As for announcements, I'm going to be honest, I didn't do my due diligence this morning and make sure that I knew the announcements. I'm being honest with you, and I apologize, Pastor. We got a prayer breakfast, November 4th at 10 a.m. This is open to everybody. If you like prayer and you like breakfast, both of those things are good. Amen. You should be there. It's going to be a great time. We've got Elder David Showalter going to be there. Bring your favorite breakfast dish for potluck breakfast. There's going to be some good food there. You should respond to that. It's going to be good food. (laughs) It is going to be good. Family prayer, the last Tuesday of every month at 7 o'clock. Mark it on your calendars. Prayer is so important. Prayer is so important. In fact, Bishop has said, if you have to choose between Tuesday night prayer and Wednesday night Bible study because of work or whatever reasons, if you had to choose one, be it prayer. Prayer is so important. Family prayer is so important. Coming together, linking arms, brother and sister, and praying with God. Amen? Amen. Your pledges, don't forget your pledges. If you have pledged anything to missionaries, make sure you are giving that. And... I thought, yeah, pray for Israel. There is some messed up stuff going on there. We're not going to go into details, but have your, have your mind and your heart praying for them. Amen. Do I got anything more? If we could, let's stand.